Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual event, Connecting the Dots, the Art and Science of Creating Good Luck. Today, we're hosted by MA Innovation Management at Central St. Martins, University of the Arts London, in collaboration with the SPS Center for Global Affairs, New York University. This event is part of the official launch of the international paperback version of Dr. Christian Bush's book, Connect the Dots, the Art and Science of Creating Good Luck, published by Penguin. For those of you who don't know, MA Innovation Management is a course that works with students who are passionate about developing creative strategies to drive innovation and transformative change in an uncertain world. The NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs prepares global citizens to make a positive impact in the world addressing critical global issues to champion social justice, equality, global security, and sustainability. So today, four exceptional leaders from the worlds of business, politics, social entrepreneurship, academia, and the media are going to be discussing how they got where they are. How can we set ourselves and others up for success and smart luck in a world full of uncertainty? How can we create a career that combines money and meaning? Even today when we cannot really tell which jobs will still exist tomorrow. So some housekeeping announcement before I introduce our guests. Do drop any questions in the YouTube chat on your right hand side and we will get back to you during the Q&A session at the end of the event. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel, and we're really lucky to have you here today. First, we have Eric Schurenberg, one of the world's leading media executives, who, as the CEO of Inc. and Fast Company, left a seminal mark on business and financial journalism. As a writer, he is the winner of the LOB and the National Magazine Award. Next, we have Michelle McKenna, Chief Information Officer of the National Football League, NFL, board member of Amway Alticor, who previously led successful digital transformation at the Walt Disney Company, Universal Studios, and Constellation Energy. Recently, Michelle has been named among the top 25 CIOs of Fortune 500 companies by Forbes. We're also having Gina Badenov, founder of Ojos Pacienten, which teaches photography to blind people, and Kataxia, which lowers the impact of our bias in talent management. She's a young global leader at the World Economic Forum, an Ashoka Fellow, and was awarded a British Empire Medal by the Queen. And finally, this discussion will be moderated by Dr. Christian Bush, Director of the CGA Global Economy Program at New York University, who also teaches at the London School of Economics, a co-founder of Leaders on Purpose and the Sandbox Network, and the former director of LSE's Innovation Lab. He's a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Forum, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, and the Thinkers 50 radar list of the 30 thinkers most likely to shape the future. So without further ado, Chris, over to you. Thank you so much, Mimi, for this uh, wonderful introduction and for pulling the strings and bringing us all together. I uh, thank you so much to Michelle also from the NYU CGA team for making this happen. And thank you so much, Michelle, Eric, and Gina, for joining us um, for what will hopefully be a very inspiring conversation. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as Mimi mentioned, at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs here, we're all about connecting dots and trying to understand how different areas, different people relate. So it gives me particular pleasure to take you on a journey today of connecting dots and trying to figure out how we can all do that in our lives and then learn from these three exceptional individuals on how we can do that to have more luck in our careers, but also more broadly to really create the life that feels meaningful to us. Um, you know, before I do that, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a bit of context about that research and the related book, and then we'll dive into the conversation um, and, and do that. Being the German I am, I have, uh, of course, two slides uh, that I will show uh, here. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of this um, to be you know, uh, to give you the context of this, um, you know, I used to be that kid in high school and Eric, we had that conversation uh, and Michelle, we also talked about this and Gina, how all of us somehow have inflection points in our lives, right? That in a way something went wrong and then it put us on a, on a journey of, wow, can I do something with this? Can I not have myself defined by this? And then um, I had that when I was younger, I used to be that kid who was thrown out of high school, had to repeat a year, probably held the uh, unofficial world record of how many dustbins uh, you can knock over on your way to school when you're driving. And then one day wasn't so lucky anymore and uh, crashed into four parked cars. All cars were completely destroyed 
including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and he was like, oh my God, he's still alive. And that idea that I was supposed to be dead, that you know, supposedly my life should have been over, that stuck with me. And I asked myself all these weird questions. You know, If I would have died, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? And at that point, I only had depressing answers. And so it took me on this intense search for meaning, trying to figure out what is this all about? And I started reading a book that I highly recommend, um, uh, which is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is all about the question, how do we find meaning in the toughest of circumstances? And I think especially in times like these we live in, um, it's a book that, that um, I reread actually when I had a severe form of COVID uh, two years ago. And now essentially uh, that kind of took me on an intense search for meaning. And I realized what gives me meaning is connecting ideas, connecting people and see how, how that all fits together. And so I started as community builder, entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, and then later went to academia. And what I found fascinating on this journey is that the most inspirational, successful, purpose-driven people, they seem to have something in common which is that they intuitively connect the dots. They see a little bit more in unexpected situations and then do something with it and turn it into positive outcomes. They cultivate serendipity. And so I found it fascinating to think about, is there a science-based framework for that? Is there a way of how we can imbue meaning in what these people experience? And so Eric, Michelle, and Gina will tell us about their own stories and how they've had that in their life. But you also find that more broadly, right? You find it maybe the way you found the love of your life in the coffee shop, you bumped into them, but you had to do something with that moment. Uh, you know, breweries during COVID where they realized, oh, we're losing a lot of restaurants, so we can't sell our alcohol, but maybe we can use that alcohol to produce hand sanitizer and become a hand sanitizer company. So this kind of pivoting happening. Um, this year is one of my favorites. Uh, any ideas? Uh, please put in the YouTube chat, any ideas what you think this might be? Any ideas uh, what you might see in front of you here? What looks like a chicken fryer? <laughs> it <laughs> so, does look like a so chicken this, fryer. Yeah, it's <laughs> close. So this is a, a sweet potato washing machine. And so a couple of years ago, um, a, a, a company in China, they produced washing machines and they received calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it and it doesn't seem to work. So what would we usually do with this unexpected moment? We'll probably say, well, don't wash your potatoes in this washing machine. It's not part of our plan. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, that's unexpected, but there's probably a lot of farmers in China and in the world who might do the same. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how unexpectedly so the potato washing machine emerged how up to 50% of innovations and inventions, right? Like Viagra and, and so on emerge. So the, the long story short being serendipity is all around us. A lot of us have it a lot. And then a lot of us have it not so much. And the question is, what is the differentiating factor here? What makes it that is, is a bit more here? And so uh, the core of this, and, and we'll dive uh, into the conversation right after this, is really the idea that at the end of the day, what all of these examples have in common is that there's always some kind of serendipity trigger. Right? There's always some kind of unexpected moment. There's farmers calling up saying, your washing machine is always breaking down. There's, you're bumping into someone in a coffee shop who could be the love of your life. There is, in the case of Viagra, they see unexpected movement in male participants' trousers when they gave the, the, the people another medication. And that's an unexpected moment. But now we have to do something with it. We have to connect the dots to something meaningful. We have to see, oh, great, that could be a new product. Oh, great, that could be a person... I could be on a date with, but I have to essentially connect the dots and then a lot of times also have the tenacity to actually go through with it. There's only, you know, so much that's in the moment. A lot of times uh, real serendipity to evolve needs a lot of grits and, and things that, that turn out. And of course, we can develop organizations that enable those moments to happen more often than not. The problem, of course, is we tend to miss serendipity all the time because we might not see the unexpected trigger. Um, if you don't expect money to lie in the street, you will not see it. I find a lot of money in the street because I expect it to be there. Unfortunately, mostly pennies, so it doesn't really uh, help me with my, my lifestyle. But the point is, once you open your eyes to the positively unexpected, it starts to happen more and more and more. But we tend to miss that a lot of times. We tend to not be able to connect the dots all the time. And we might miss the tenacity to actually do that. And so one of the things that came out of our research that we did here at the, the Center for Global Affairs and, and at the LSE is really that we did studies with leading CEOs, for example, around the world. And we try to understand what is it that differentiates you from others that, that might be less successful. And one of the key themes was really that they're extremely good at building a muscle for the unexpected. They're extremely good at trying to figure out 
How can I see meaning in the unexpected and do something with it? And so the core gist of this research and of this book is to say, how do you build a science-based framework for the, this kind of muscle for, for the unexpected and what are exercises we can all do? We don't have time today to dive into this. We, we want to focus on the panel. I mean, we have three exceptional individuals, so um, I don't want to take time away from this. I want to leave you with two ideas. One is that we tend to you know, assume that we can map life out, right? So we have this original plan, but then life happens, right? It's much more like a squiggle, but we might still narrate it as if it was step by step. So you might present your CV to an employer and say, I always wanted to do this, and then I wanted to do this, and then this. Yeah, but maybe you just ran into someone at a conference and they told you about something and, and that happened. And so one key idea of this work is to say, no, let's give an active vocabulary to the idea that you can cultivate serendipity, that you can develop a mindset that allows you to make the best out of these incidences. And that's actually not threatening your authority. It's not threatening your life, but actually the unexpected becomes your ally. You've been good at cultivating serendipity. And so we want to legitimize that idea that people actually do that. People like Michelle, Eric, and, and Gina intuitively cultivate a lot of serendipity. And, and that's really at the core of this. There's a lot of practices we can do. Um, and I want to leave you with one and then dive into conversation because I think it's one that everyone can use, um, especially also if you're an incoming student or you are a young professional or you're a professor, uh, you name it. Um, and I'm a big fan of the hook strategy. And the hook strategy is really about saying, how can I put more dots out there that other people can connect based on what they are interested in? And that's really about saying, how do I use every conversation, every interaction to see the couple of potential dots that other people can connect? And so to give you an example, uh, there's an amazing entrepreneur in London, Ollie Barrett. And if you would ask Ollie the dreaded, what do you do question, right? So let's say you come into NYU and someone asks you, so what do you do? Or some, some Martins and someone says, what do you do? You can just say, I'm an innovation student, or I'm a CGA student, or you can say something like what Ollie would do, that he says, I'm a technology entrepreneur, <laughs> recently read into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here, um, this, this brilliant entrepreneur in London, um, he gives you three potential dots where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. I recently read into the philosophy of science. Uh, you should give a guest lecture at my institution. My God, such a coincidence, we're hosting piano lessons. You should stop by, you name it. The point is we can sprinkle those kind of points into conversations and allow other people to connect the dots for us. I'm a big fan of making a serendipity journal where you write down a couple of curiosities you have, a couple of interests, and then building them into every conversation. And it's practices like these that we can use in our own lives and in organizations, right? Where we can ask people, what surprised you last week? Is there something that, you know, farmers wash their potato washing machines differently. Could that be a hook for something interesting that we could do with it? And so it's really about saying, how do we open ourselves up for having more of these dots out there, but also allowing other people to connect dots for us. And so the long story short is there's a lot of these exercises. If you, if you want to learn more, that's really what, what the book is about. My editor tells me to, to mention that this is the book um, and to actually put a picture of it here so that you have the visual. Um, the, the link is there, um, connect the dots now. Um, and uh, we also have educator uh, copies um, for, for those of you who um, want to use those educator uh, copies. But now, without further ado, I'd love to dive into the conversation with our absolutely fantastic uh, participants who, uh, you know, we connected via our joint passion for serendipity um, and, and for somehow initiating meaningful change uh, in the world. And uh, I'm closing this now so that we can see the whole presence of these um, uh, uh, fantastic uh, individuals who have uh, become dear friends and, 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 and who have inspired me a lot um, in, in our research, but also more broadly. I mean, you've inspired uh, hundreds of thousands of people in, in your journeys. And so I'm, I'm excited that, that you now also give us the time to, to really share um, your insights with, with our audience. Uh, Mimi already introduced the panel, so I will not uh, repeat that. I will just say, uh, Michelle, uh, absolutely inspiring. I mean, the first time we met, I remember it, it was supposed to be a one and a half hour type conversation. It ended up to be, I think, five or six hours. And, and, and it, it was amazing, literally every area in life you could, uh, you could, you could, you could think of. Um, as mentioned, Michelle is, is both a, a brilliant individual and, you know, you really kind of like made your own path, right? You became one of the most like interesting people when it comes to digital transformation in the world at all these uh, wonderful companies that, that Mimi mentioned by creating your own luck. And I, I was very inspired by how you did that. And so I'm very excited to learn more. Eric, the same, uh, you know, when we met, um, I remember 
where uh, we met serendipitously so by a mutual friends uh, in, in, in a picnic in Washington Square Park and, and uh, we hit it off and, 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 and had, had such wonderful conversations and Eric has a wonderful podcast, The Human Factor, uh, that we then uh, had a, a wonderful discussion, also highly recommended to take a look at, at The Human Factor. Eric, as you can, uh, or as you will hear from his answers, extremely thoughtful, extremely reflective, and so he he, he has those kind of conversations with people that actually truly bring out the human factor. So um, I'm sure if, if you check out that podcast, um, you'll have a lot of joy listening to him. And then Gina, of course, we've, we've known each other for a very long time. Um, and we, I'm very nostalgic seeing you. We, we grew up together in a way in London. Um, and, um, and, uh, and Gina has been extremely inspiring throughout our lives in terms of the social projects you've developed, Ojos Caciente and Capexa and, and others where you essentially have designed not only experiences for people to connect, and I'm sure you'll talk more about this, but, but you really have also put people on the map who wouldn't have been on the map, right? You, you have focused a lot on blind people, for example, who then you show their superpowers and you show what makes them actually, everything that could be a quote unquote shadow could also be a superpower. And I think you've been extremely brilliant at this. And this is why we wanted you on this panel also today that I think you've been brilliant in how you reframe situations from what could be perceived as a weakness to actually what could be an inflection point for something beautiful in, in life. And so um, I'm delighted that you're with us and, and, and that you're sharing your, your, your great experiences with us and, and welcome from, from Mexico or to Mexico um, in this as well. So without further ado, um, I'd love to dive in. And, and Michelle, first question to, to you is really, what, what was the, the role of serendipity in your life and, and, and how have you created your own kind of smart luck in your life and, and what can we learn from that? Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, I'll start by saying it was really quite a miracle when I actually found the serendipity mindset um, because I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew I had been doing it my whole life. And it was so great to see that, wow, I could actually teach other people how to do this. Um, it, it starts with, you know, that interview question is, how did you get here? And you always feel like you've got to give that sort of set answer that people are expecting to hear. Um, but you're right. Life is a journey with a lots of ups and downs. And so, you know, I'm often I can't I grew up uh, in a very small town in Alabama, very far from Park Avenue, New York City, for sure. It was another world. It was something I dreamed of. I, I dreamed of going places, but I, I didn't have the financial means um, or any way. I was the first in my family to go to college on many sides of the family. So I had really no way I could see how to get from point A to point B. And along the way, um, I think what drove me as a child uh, was curiosity. And I think the best thing uh, you can do is never lose that. Uh, you know, the curiosity you have as a child Kids ask questions constantly, why, 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 or I'm interested, how did this happen? What did this do? And that was my natural inclination. And I would, you know, actually probably be a bit of a pain in the ass to people around what was what. And I sort of kept that uh, throughout my life. And also this notion of just uh, being open, and you write about it in your book, to unsought information. If you're always listening, um, you never know what you're going to learn or who you're going to meet or the person you're going to meet. And, you know, I, I won't spend too much time taking you through my whole uh, story, but I'll kind of start at the end as to where I am now. And in the most serendipitous of uh, moments was how I met you, Christian. And it was one of those times when someone asked me to go meet with someone I had to fly from New York to LA to meet them. Um, I really didn't feel like doing it. I was tired. I'd just come from a long uh, trip, but I was interested. My curiosity got the best of me. I took the opportunity. I went to the meeting and uh, where I met an amazing entrepreneur who has created uh, just, he's a number one pediatrician in the world and has created a, an amazing product for newborns. I, was talking to him about AI and technology. And that's why I went there was to learn about technology. But along the way, his questions to me were, how did you get where you are? It's so interesting. You grew up in Alabama. How did you get there? 
So I started describing to him this serendipity thing and that I had read this amazing book uh, called The Serendipity Mindset. And I didn't even realize it, but that's what I was doing, cultivating serendipity and making my own look. And uh, he said, I'll be right back. He stepped out of his office and came back with your book, Christian, and said, well, here you go. Here's a copy because Christian is my son-in-law. And I was like, whoa, mind blown. So you just never know how and when you can meet someone or something that can change your life. And oftentimes it is through real, uh, some, in my case, it's been some tragedy. Uh, my husband passed suddenly. Um, I, I, I was the one who found him shortly thereafter. I had breast cancer and I came back from that, came back from both of those things. And people will say, how did you do that? How did you keep moving your career forward? And I think it's, you know, the cultivated relationships I've built throughout the years is, is how I'm still standing and how I'm not just standing, but thriving. And as I go into my next journey and people ask me what I want to do and what I do for a living, yes, I have a title called CIO at the NFL, but I'm really... I would say I'm a dot connector. I see things other people don't see. And I think it's the curiosity and it's the practice of that and the practice of doing well for others. Um, and, and thinking about, as Christian just said, people that you meet along the way, what are their journeys and what are they looking to do? And you find if you help others connect, it comes back to you. And I know a lot has been written about that. And I certainly believe in putting good karma in the world and it comes back. But that is really how I got from just a long shot of, you know, where I was. And now I sit in an office with all Ivy League people, and it's amazing that people think I'm one of them. Like they assume, automatically assume I must have gone to an Ivy League school. I must have known someone. I must. How did I get a job at the NFL without any sports background? Um and that also was serendipity. I was working at an energy company after a long career at both Disney and Universal, driving amazing transformation like the Wizarding World, a Harry Potter launch and things like that. And um, we were selling our company, the energy company. I love football. I was playing fantasy football. I clicked on a link that said jobs. And there was listed a VP of IT infrastructure, which is not what I do, but it was interesting enough that I applied. And then I started working my dot connecting, found someone who knew someone. And I took the train from Baltimore to New York, um, like every day for two weeks so that I could be in New York and have coffee. <laughs> and eventually I got someone to meet me for coffee and they had already decided on someone, but they agreed to interview me. And not only did I get the job, I redefined the job. I said, you need a CIO here's what you need to do. And so those kinds of opportunities is, uh, you know, you could look at it as a risk to take something that looks like a step down, but you also could have the opportunity to turn it into what has been one of the most rewarding chapters in my, my career. So that's a little bit of a short journey um, and happy to, you know, take any questions about any of that. But uh, I'm just thrilled to be here and, and so relieved that there's actually a science behind what I was doing and that I can make the next chapter of my life more about helping young people know how to do that their whole lives. And instead of figuring it out in their, you know, at, at my phase of life. Thank you so much. I mean, Michelle, I feel your stories are, are extremely inspiring in so many ways, right? And I, I remember after our meeting, the only regret I had was, gee, we should have met before we wrote the book because your story is, is the perfect chapter in a way for, um, for, for something like this. And, and I, I feel it's extremely inspiring, you know, when we dive deeper, I think your reflection points in life and how you've been reframing, how you've been putting yourself out there in ways that don't always feel comfortable, right? And that's something we talk a lot about here um, how do you don't assume that you have this one way that you have to take because it feels more comfortable? A lot of times it isn't because you might not feel aligned with it. And that makes it actually extremely uncomfortable. And um, so you'd rather take a little bit of discomfort in that journey. So we'll talk more about this. But for now, Michelle, thank you so much for, for, for this inspiring uh, kind of lead into the conversation and, and the yeah, beautiful serendipitous uh, moments uh, in, in there. And I think that, that leads us right uh, to Eric. Eric, you... Um, 
you know, in a way, when we had our conversations, a lot of your life, you also mentioned, right, that you kind of, you had like a lot of time, the idea that you knew what you wanted. And then a lot of times life happened differently. And I, I particularly remember also in our conversation, how much you talked about, you know, whenever I'm doing interviews with people, they always tell me like they did this and this and this. I don't necessarily believe them all the time that they did. So it's, it's fascinating how you also, I think, intuitively from the other side, right? A lot of people in the room will be the ones who will seek jobs. And I think you from the other side have seen that that's not always true. And, and it's easier actually to tell people the truth about, um, about something in, in that way. But long story short, Eric, what is your kind of serendipity journey and, and how has that uh, uh, been playing a part in, in your life? Well, like every successful person, uh, like Michelle, I'm sure like Gina, my career was very much the squiggle that you outlined in your slide. Uh, and uh, whether in our sort of our narrative mind, we sort of can tell the story of how it was a straight line. Uh, my squiggle is so squiggly that there's no point in even trying to do that. <laughs> I, uh, so I came to New York from Ohio uh, to make my fortune as an actor. And uh, that, 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 that dream lasted, uh, uh, you know, ended the way so many actor dreams did. And uh, believe me, the world is much better for having had me as an editor and writer than as yet another mediocre actor. The world is way better off. And so am I. Uh, but it is certainly an indication of how life can take turns that you don't expect. The thing, I, you, I just reflected on this in, in response to the prompt that you sent, so you sent us by email. The thing that turned me from acting to the career that I that I built was that I was walking across Seventh Avenue near Carnegie Hall, and I was run over by a taxi. A taxi ran over my foot as I was in the crosswalk. And out of the settlement, I had enough money to go back to college and study journalism uh, and publishing. And that launched a career that bounced around a, a lot of different places, but, but finally brought me to where I am now. Um, so <laughs> one of the things I would say, uh, if I could, to my younger self, who at the time thought that, um, you know, my acting career was, uh, you know, in stasis, to, to put it mildly. And here I was now in the hospital with a broken foot. Uh, how bad could that be? Well, it turned out to be a pretty good thing. And that, I think, is a, a good lesson to carry forward to that when things happen, um, find the upside to it and then build from that. Um, I, there, was a, there was a moment um, later on. I was the editor in chief of Money Magazine then, and I was keynote speaking at a, at a hotel, you know, in the hotel ballroom in. New Brunswick, New Jersey. It happened that New Brunswick, New Jersey is where I did one of my roles when I was an actor. So I, there was a moment in which I could leave the rubber chicken dinner and walk around the corner to the site of that little theater where I had played this, uh, this recurring role for me. It was a kind of existential moment in which I sort of, sort of confronted how unpredictable life can be. One of the things that you and I talked about, Christian, when we met was a Richard Wiseman study about making your own luck. You must know this very well. And, and for me, it was, it kind of crystallizes the importance of, of being open to, you know, the things that can, the good things that can happen in life. Do you mind if I, if I run through that, the experiment with the newspaper? So Richard Wiseman was a, uh, an early researcher on luck, and to illustrate how differently people who are open to serendipity see the world versus people who are not, he constructed uh, an experiment in which he, he gathered people who defined themselves as lucky and another group who defined themselves as unlucky. He gave them a newspaper, and he said, I want you to count the number of photographs in this newspaper um, and uh, there will be a reward for you if you get the number right. The unlucky people took several minutes to get through the newspaper and count up all the photographs. The people who considered themselves lucky 
were finished in about 10 seconds. Because on page two of the newspaper was a huge half page ad in huge block type that said, stop counting. There are 43 pictures in this newspaper. The unlucky people read right past it because they were so focused on doing the task. The people, the lucky people were more open to it and realized and, and took the opportunity when it presented themselves. If there's any lesson from my career is uh, that those opportunities can come from places you are least likely to expect. Uh, I became the president of Inc. and the editor-in-chief of Inc. because of a recommendation from two freelance writers that I barely knew. Uh, the idea that um, at the path that brought me to the editor of um, the editorship of Money Magazine was uh, a weak link um, from this journalism school that I went to that got me into the organization um, of Time Inc., which was at the time the largest magazine company in the world. Um, and even uh, how I met my wife was a sheer uh, example of luck in which we happened to be sitting next to each other at a seminar that I didn't want to go to, very much like, like uh, Michelle's story. Uh, so, you know, I, you, you had asked if there was a lesson that, uh, that we, would, we would want to convey to our younger selves. It, it is that, to be open, that the great things that will turn your life around and be the thing that, is, that gives you the most meaning in life is something that you can't predict. You should put yourself, you, what you can do to help is to put yourself in a position where lucky things can happen, but then be open. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for, for, for such an important life lesson. And I think we, we can all resonate very deeply with, with exactly that. And, and exactly also that you don't see the opportunities right in front of you if you're so focused on one thing, being at one career, being at one particular person you want to go out with, whatever it is, and you might miss. I mean, that's a lot of the rom-com stories, I guess, are, right? But you don't see the person right in front of your eyes because you're so focused on someone else. And that's the same with careers and, and so, right? And I think, Eric, your story beautifully illustrates, I think, how we can think about this in, in, in those ways. And so thank you for, for sharing this, this inspiring story. And how you turned in, like, this point, right, the, the, the accident, quite literally, you made the accident meaningful, right? And you, you, you did something with it rather than having yourself defined. I'm right. And that's, that's beautiful. Um, yes, Christian, you, know, you, uh, you and I have vehicular accidents in our, is sort of at our pivot points. It's like, yeah, who knew? Very true. Um, Gina, uh, coming to you in terms of, you know, you obviously have uh, attracted a lot of smart luck in your life by hard work, right? You've worked very hard to have smart luck in your life. And do you want to share a little bit with us? What, how has your journey been when it comes to this and, and what can we learn from it? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think for me, uh, part of something that has a lot of influence on my journey with luck and serendipity is actually being half Mexican and half British. I must say that has had a huge influence. Um, my dad is British, my mom is Mexican, and you can imagine that's a very crazy mix. Um, <laughs> so that mix, I made it for great, great use. And what I mean is that in early ages made me very curious about different ways of doing things, different ways of living, because I was always exposed to those two countries, those cultures, which are very different in many ways. And I don't know, I think that has had definitely an influence in my personality, my curiosity, being a dreamer of everything is possible because I go to the UK and I see what's happening and then I bring it to Mexico and, and I find amazing things in Mexico I want to take to the UK. So I think that uh, coming and going it definitely has influenced my journey. I'm a, I, I love dancing, so I see life as a dance and you need dancing partners, right? So I see when you find people in your life, there's a reason. And I'm always open when someone is like, I want you to meet this person or if someone contacts me, it's like, they're here for a reason. Maybe it's a short dance, maybe it's just a longer dance, but I, I'm always curious to grab a coffee or pick up the phone and, and listen because um, I, I do feel that's how it works, no? We're moving and, and it's within us if we stop and listen or we carry on. And also I have my photography part. So that's my storyteller side of things. 
since early ages, I was very curious about people's stories and the differences. I wanted to know why people did what they do, how they do it. Um, and I think that's really what made me very open to see life as these constellations of stars that when we're connecting them, we're shining together. And, and I'm looking for all those stars to keep putting them as part of my constellation of life, you know? Uh, but I, I would say if, I, if I'm not in that position of willing to move, that doesn't happen. So many times within my environment, my friends, my family, my teamwork, you no know, colleagues, um, they're like, you just grab the moment, you just go for it. And I was like, I listen to my intuition. I'm not just doing it randomly. There's an inner voice that tells me, go for it. Even if it sounds crazy, maybe I don't have the answers, maybe meeting this person doesn't make sense. Uh, but the intuition has been a great friend of mine from early stages, to be honest. Um, and, and I'm very grateful to have that ally. And definitely being open, being willing to move, listen to the intuition and be curious. And I always say, I already have the no, I'm going to go for the yes. Meaning <laughs> if anything goes wrong, I'm back to where I am now, right? <laughs> so so um, well said. <laughs> Yeah. Which is funny, and, and I remember early stages, I was in Spain, and um, I was starting to do all the um, research of how I could teach photography to blind people, and uh, I read Blindness, the book of Saramago, and it was a great inspiration in many levels about what I call mental blindness, and I went, I was invited in Spain to this event randomly, you know, this moment that I ended up there, and suddenly Saramago was there, and I was like, oh my god, I cannot believe Saramago is here. And I remember going to him and saying, hi, I'm Gina, no? And he just looked at me, but very casual. So he, he must have thought maybe I know her because she's very friendly with me and very casual how I approach him. And I just said, you don't know me, but I, I read your book and it was a huge inspiration for the work I'm doing. And I know it's not the right moment because you're very busy, but can I get your email? And then I, I'll contact you, no? And he said, yes, of course. And then I remember opening my bag and I didn't have any paper. I just had a pen. And the only piece of paper I had in my bag was a little note of a teddy bear, a blue teddy bear from a shop. I went to buy some clothes for my niece that had just been born. So it was a baby uh, a clothes uh, shop that gave me that little card. So it was a little teddy bear and that was it. And I was like, either I, come, I give this as a piece of paper, or I lose opportunity. So I actually brought out my little teddy bear piece of paper and I said, I'm sorry, this is the only piece of paper I have. Can you write your email here? Um, and I still have that piece of paper with Aramago's email. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, <laughs> I approached him and we, we ended up having a really nice conversation uh, before he passed away. But that's, so, that's stayed with me because it's those moments of, of going for it, you know, of saying, if I stop and say, oh, I know this is not very nice to have my little teddy bear on, or if I see him as, oh, Saramago, and what, you know? And, and I think um, that's for me what I would say, that the invitation is to really be curious, be, bring that dreamer, listen to our intuition, be willing to move. And honestly, the no, we already have it. Let's go for the yes. What, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> and, and Gina, that's that. I mean, I feel there's so much richness in, in what you just uh, mentioned on so many levels, right? Both in terms of how do you develop that mature gut feeling, right? So to not just kind of go with fight or flight, but to actually listen to both the gut and then, you know, compare with the information you have and then kind of act on it like in an informed way. Um, a lot of the leaders actually in, in the research, right? That's the one thing they, they do extremely well, that they have an informed gut feeling, an informed intuition. Um, that they work with and based on that they make they make their decisions and then you also mentioned a point you know i personally resonate very deeply with which is uh, that idea you know that especially when you have fear of rejection and things like that right or the inner imposter that in a way a lot of times you think the sting of rejection is the worst thing that can happen but once you reframe that to know the regret of not having tried like that you walk outside the room and you think ah what could have happened had i brought up the idea had i talked to that person had i did it that's the worst feeling, right? And so I feel once you reframe that, then actually it gets much easier to also endure rejection because to your point, you you assume the no anyways then, and then if the yes happens, even better, right? And I think that's a beautiful <laughs> way you frame that. And then the, the curiosity piece, I think that's something all, all three of you also beautifully touched on. I'd love to, for the sake of time, really dive into um, like the, the core like lessons in life that you've had that you'd love to share with um with with our audience we have a lot of people in the audience who are you know starting out we have people in the audience who might be in a transition towards a new career a new life 
Um, and I think one of the themes, you know, when you look back now and you think, ah, what would I have loved to know? What is there something that 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 if I were in this transition period that 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 really kind of um, would would be important or starting out? Uh, and Michelle, I think with you maybe also, I think a lot of the themes that came out of our conversation was this this role of, um, you know, how, how can you get comfortable with ambiguity and 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 the idea that how do you in a way, use that to your advantage rather than something that kind of like, you know, gets you into a depressive uh, mode. And so, um, Michelle, over to you in terms of, I, are there some life lessons you'd, you'd love to share? Yeah, uh, first, just to touch on the ambiguity thing, um, and you touched on it earlier. I have found in my life, when I'm most uncomfortable with something, my gut is telling me I really should dig deeper on it um, because there's something there. My inner voice is very strong. My gut is strong. And so uh, embracing ambiguity, um, I think you said it, you had some study in, in, in your book around the difference between an average student and an exceptional student is an average student would come to you with a pretty well laid out thesis about what they wanted to study and how they wanted to study it. And an exceptional one comes in with a lot of ambiguity. I'm not sure. Uh, this is what my feeling is. And uh, I feel like that's where I've always lived in this gut feeling world. And uh, at times in the corporate world, you'll be called, um, you know, that you're, you're a little too sensitive or you are maybe, I've, I was even told at one point in my career at Disney that I was being too authentic, that, you know, I needed to work on my accent and I needed to uh, not ask uh you know, like, look, I needed to respect the fact that Michael Eisner was uh, the CEO of the company and I just couldn't go up to him and talk to him about things. And my inner voice was like, why not? He's exactly like I am. He just happens to have made it. And I work for him. Why wouldn't I talk to him? And I always have had that. And I don't know where it came from other than I, I just felt like the human factor and the human condition is we're all human. And if we just sort of respect each other uh, along the way and um, embrace ambiguity and, you know, that never stops by the way, even though we have both achieved all of us on this call have achieved great uh, success in life. Uh, we're always innovating and changing ourselves. And here I am in the middle of it now, uh, I'm finishing my career at the NFL after 10 seasons. I just finished my 10th Super Bowl and I'm about to step out and do something else. And I don't know what it is. And I feel that unbelievable uncertainty and feeling in my stomach that would make a lot of people afraid. But what it does for me is, uh, yeah, it makes me afraid, but it also makes me like I might be on the verge of the biggest chapter of my life. And I just have to be open to it. So that's what I would say. A lesson in life is ambiguity, embracing it and living with it. And, and then harnessing it um, is just very, very powerful. And especially for young people who have this pressure put on them to have their life figured out. Um, it's just not reality that you will have your life figured out at, uh, in your 20s. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great one. And Michelle, to your point, I think everyone in this conversation probably really resonates with this idea that there's only so much you can theoretically think about what you can do next versus like going out there, talking with people, to your point, flying to LA, figuring things out. And then, you know, then essentially things start to happen, right? Once you once you put it in motion, versus if you sit back and just um, reflect on it, which I think then brings a lot of anxiety um, in, into the conversation. So very excited, obviously, for your next steps. I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening to this conversation are having their checkbooks out now and kind of already there's a silent <laughs> auction happening for, for who, who, will, who will get Michelle uh, on, the, on the next board and, and things next. But uh, um, Michelle, yeah, I, I found that extremely inspiring how you've navigated ambiguity throughout your life and, and how you, especially in those tough periods, uh, have, have really uh, turned that. And I think to the point you mentioned, um, to what makes exceptional people, right? It, it might be exceptional students. It might be exceptional people with exceptional careers. A lot of times it is that kind of idea that they allow for certain ambiguity because that pushes them towards the next interesting thought, the next interesting thing. Mediocracy usually means you go within the trodden path, right? And, and that feels safe, but actually 
when you look back after 50 years, it might not be the thing that, that you might be most proud of. And I think um, a lot of our conversations, right, are also about, I guess, the question of what are deathbed regrets? And, and I think a key one might be, have I lived up to who I could have been? And I think that Michelle and, and Eric and Gina, I think you embody the idea that you're constantly thinking about, okay, how do I make sure that I that I am on a path that feels meaningful to me? And, and, and putting the pressure off that it's an exact position or an exact thing, but more that it feels beautiful in, in the moment. And with this, I mean, Eric, um, uh, coming to you next, uh, some of your kind of gems of life lessons uh, learned that you would like to imbue on the, uh, the audience? Sure. Uh, but first, let me say how much I am struck by how my gems of life are so similar to what we've heard from Gina and Michelle. So it, it may be that there are only kind of a finite number of gems, or at least the gems all fall into a, a few different categories. One of them is to phrase your life around the question that Tony Robbins often uses, which is, what would you do if you were not afraid? <sighs> and I think of Gina's going up to that uh, novelist that she admired, um, even though, you know, he doesn't know who she is. And that is amazing. I think of Michelle stepping down from the NFL and starting to write the next chapter in her life while not knowing what that's going to be. That's incredibly admirable. And we'll get to how that reflects on me in a, in a moment too. But so I would say that um, one of the gems is not to be afraid to bet on yourself, that that mm. is probably the, the wisest thing. Everybody from Michael Eisner to the the person who moves the scenery around on a Disney movie is the same human being at heart. Um, mm -hmm. Every top executive suffers from imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Everybody is insecure. Mm -hmm. um, everybody responds well to kindness mm -hmm. and generosity. And that one of the best ways to make good things happen for you is to build relationships with people with no expectation that there will be some kind of reward. Um, the, the idea that every kind of encounter with someone is a transaction is false and not very, and not very productive. Um, I too am at an inflection point. I, I don't know if you had planned this, Kristen, <laughs> bringing Michelle and me on, but uh, four weeks ago, I stepped down from my role as the CEO of Inc. and Fast Company. And I decided that I had reached the stage in my life where, uh, you know, I had, I had just, to, just to, to state a fact, that I had brought this media company that had been money losing for its entire life to profitability. And that, so I, was, I had sort of achieved that milestone and was leaving the company in uh, on firm financial ground. So that was kind of a, a high note on which to leave. And it was time to think about the legacy career that I wanted to have, not the resume building career, but the, but the legacy. What do I want to do next? How do I, how would I answer the question about what are the regrets, regrets I will have in life? And uh, so I thought that the thing that might be the best match of what gives me a sense of purpose and uses the experience and the skills that I've built up over my years is to join the fight against misinformation and be an advocate for truth and restoring trust in media. Like Michelle in the um, early stages of our pre-conversation before, before this um, session started, talked about how important trust is and how it's the foundation of everything. It certainly is the foundation of democracy. Um, so that is, uh, but again, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out. But <laughs> it, it seemed like that is, if I didn't do it, I would regret it. Just like uh, you know, decades ago, I had to give acting a try because I would always regret it if I didn't. Um, and it didn't work out exactly as I wanted, but it worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Eric, thank you for, for sharing. And, and again, I think hopefully some serendipity comes out of this session that, that um, you know, those who are listening, who are into the true, true truth, uh, not the, I guess there's some platforms now that claim to be truth, but are not necessarily 
uh, the truth. And so um, hopefully you join the fight with uh, with Eric to 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 do the proper truth uh, news. Um, and 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 Eric, I think what you mentioned also um, you know resonates a lot. This kind of idea of how do you in a way it reminded me of this this article in the Guardian, uh, deathbed regrets. Like if, if you Google deathbed regrets, the Guardian they ask nuns what do people tell them on their deathbeds that they regret the most. And it's usually the same things, right? I would have loved to live a meaning that feels a life that feels meaningful to me and wasn't kind of pushed by people from the outside, you know, family and, and others. Um, I wish I had somehow built meaningful relationships. And I think, Eric, that's one of the major points I think that, that you brought home so beautifully in terms of saying, how do we not focus on transactions? Everyone feels it, right? When you are part of a transactional relationship, you feel it and you're not excited about it. You will not connect as many dots for that person. You will not be as excited about that person. You want to have a true, genuine relationship and that feels right. That actually feels more positive, right? When you, like every psychological study tells us giving makes us happier than taking, even if we are a lot of times used the other way around, but also then, you know, beautiful things um, usually emerge from the universe. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful um, uh, thought, uh, Eric, in that regard as well, to move from transaction to, uh, to meaningful relationships. Um, and then with, you know, with, with yours, kind of your life lessons and, and things you would have loved to know when you started out, what, what comes to mind for you? I think there's one that I, I, I would have loved I had, but um, is to embrace vulnerability and setbacks, not mm -hmm. run away from them. <laughs> I, I love this idea of inviting people to see vulnerability as a hub for innovation and to connect uh, and to really keep grounded. So actually, vulnerability is really cool <laughs> if you bring it as an ally. And also those moments of setbacks. Um, a few years ago, someone told me the story about the humming. I love hummingbirds. And I was like, I wish I knew this before. And this, the hummingbird is the only bird that flies backwards to keep more flying forward, right? And I'm like, that's life for me. Those setbacks, those moments of failure that we're also afraid of, it's within us to reframe it as is in a moment to fly backwards, slow down, what's going on, observe, learn, you know, be willing to be vulnerable in that moment, to reach out, to, to really re rethink what went wrong, right? So actually, I find those moments of vulnerability and setbacks or failures as great hub for innovation, for connection, for keeping you grounded as a human being, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, no? So I wish those were things that I knew earlier in life, and that would be for me, the, the biggest um, ask, ask and invitation for everyone that is listening is don't be afraid of being vulnerable because that's where the dots are going to connect, both within yourself and with others. And don't be afraid to make mistakes because imperfection, there's so much beauty in imperfection, but we need to be willing to see it and to embrace it. So I think for me, those, those are the ones. I would, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful, and, and and I think Gina, to your point, right? When you think about, we talked earlier about the beautiful dinners in the in the dark that you organize, where people connect by and not being able to see each other. And what it does a lot of times is when you don't have a perception of someone, when you look at them, you have a completely different conversation, right? Because you're more intrigued about, you know, what moves the person, what brought them here, like those kind of things that, in a way, are much more about the the deeper. Um, motivations of people, but also then reveal, I think, interesting, quote unquote, vulnerable uh, pieces of, of information that someone might want it to be in an area of discomfort for a while. I think things that I think um, lead to that. And I think, yeah. Yeah. And I think in that moment is a perfect example of surrender, I, of saying, yeah. I'm going to walk into the dark because I trust the process and the journey, and I'm going to be vulnerable with all the other people walking into the dark. And once you all go in that mood and in that energy, you connect because you, uh, you're physically you're also connecting because you're supporting each other to get to your place. But once you get to your place and start having your dinner and your conversation, you're all in the, at the, the levels of play field. It's about human beings. It doesn't matter your titles and your labels. You, if you don't speak, you do not exist. And are you willing to open and connect beyond labels? Yeah. And, and that's yeah. a moment of surrender. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I would yeah. just... Michelle? Yeah, just to add to that, you know, the human connection is everything. And if I have an experience that I would share that really shaped what I really want to focus on, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this either, but I really want to dedicate myself to closing the digital divide in the, this country for sure and the world. But um, I ran the 2020 virtual draft for the NFL 
And we had all of these player prospects who were on the verge of becoming multimillionaires. Okay. They were, um, but they were, you know, they're human. And I, because I was setting up the technology ended up speaking on a very human level with each of them. And it really opened my eyes to some of them were hesitant to allow us into their homes to film the draft because they didn't have internet or they couldn't afford the internet. And they didn't want to tell me. So they would go somewhere to take the call or the test. And I, when I figured it out, I had, you know, I cut everybody else off and just had one-to-one conversations. And some of these people are playing, you know, top of their game now in the NFL and are, you know, making hundreds of millions of dollars and big contracts in the long run. But at that moment, they weren't okay with us seeing in their living room because their living room wasn't something they wanted to show the world. Um, They didn't have connectivity and ability. They only had their cell phone. Um, And even then, you know, it it might not be the kind of, and, and, and I was just struck by getting them into a situation where they could participate in the biggest night of their lives and their families. And I turned into not a technology person, but a person helping these guys find Airbnbs that had internet that had, you know, I had to call Verizon and Comcast and all of our partners and say, you have to turn internet on for these people there. I I can't believe they don't have internet. This is, you know, so you never know where that like sparks going to come from that actually might define the thing on your deathbed that you say, I am so proud. I had a hand in somehow doing that. Now that's a big, bold goal. Um, but by connecting the dots with people like this, it's a hundred percent possible. So. And I love how you're, you're connecting also, you know, between, I think what you said earlier, right? Asking why a lot. Like if you if you just assume that the player is arrogant because like that they don't let you into their home because for some arrogant reason they don't versus like trying to figure out what is it really behind that? Is there some kind of underlying thing? And I think we've all seen that right in our relationships. It's never the toothpaste that's in the wrong place that's the problem. It's the disrespect that is manifested by the toothpaste, right? And so we will never know that if we don't ask why and if we don't try to understand what's the underlying theme. And Michelle, I think you you mentioned a beautiful point there um, that that's extremely um, close to the heart. I think uh, for everyone at, at here at the Center for Global Affairs also, which is there's so much structural inequality out there. There's so much out there where people have very different starting positions in terms of how how quickly they can connect the dots, whom they have access to, what kind of networks, what kind of education. And so I think hand in hand with the mindset that we've been talking a lot about, they also have to be you know work around policy. It's not enough to just give someone a scholarship to something. No, there need to be three mentors who can directly also help them with a job. They need to be, we need to think about holistic solutions to these kind of questions. And so Michelle, I'm excited that you're also thinking about these kind of quote unquote macro questions. How do you provide the environment for people to be able to flourish like this? And, and I think that's kind of a big um, big theme also in, in, in the work that I think all of us have, have been involved in and I'm glad you, you bring that up. Um, and that leads us to our, our final question. I mean, this is one of these conversations that I would, you know, love to never end. And, and, and next time we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll allocate five hours rather than one. Uh, but um, we, we have um, one final question for you, um, which comes from the audience. And it's a mix between, I think, what you already touched on and what I think is a, is a great, beautiful question. And it's really broadly speaking about how do you define success now in your lives but then the, the specific question also, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? So how do you, you know, when you think about, I think we talked a lot about the question of deathbeds and everything else. And, and that's really what it's a lot of times about, right? How do you, what kind of ancestor do you want to be in the world? And more broadly, what does success mean for you nowadays when you think about it? And maybe also how has it changed? Uh, Michelle, do you want to, to start? Yeah, I think this is definitely something that's evolves um, all the time. And I think living through a global pandemic where we were all at home with more time to think. I think if I hadn't had the pandemic, I might not have ever slowed down long enough to actually evaluate that I was unhappy uh, and wasn't being fulfilled. Uh, I loved my work and I loved the people I worked with and it was a super cool job, but I would not have taken the time to slow down. The other thing that I would not have had 
is dedicated time with my 25 year old son, who is also, by the way, an actor (laughs) struggling (laughs) in New York city. (laughs) And he and I were living together in my Florida home and his outlook on life and what he admired me for to hear it from his own words, the kinds of things you would probably hear in a eulogy (laughs) if you were able to hear your eulogy or, you know, you you don't get to hear these things and his just openness about what he was proud of me about. None of it had anything to do with my career accomplishments. It was about my kindness, um, giving, um, how I try to make the world a better place for anybody that lives in my life. And, um, that's what he thinks of me and that's how he models his life and wants to do really good in the world. Uh, that's what woke me up to, whoa, yeah, it's not going to matter at the end that I put on the 2020 virtual draft. It's not going to matter that I launched the wizarding world of Harry Potter. It's not going to matter that I was there for the first cruise ship out of the port at Disney. What matters is all the lives I touch, the people I connect, that I do something to make it better. And I know this is motherhood and apple pie, but it honestly takes a focus to do it. And it takes, you have to just remind yourself. And I always call it the toothbrush test. If I'm brushing my teeth and I can't look myself in the eyes and feel really good about who's looking back, it's time to change. And that's kind of what happened to me. And uh, that's how I left Disney. That's how I'm moved on from universal in some ways, even though that's a whole nother story. Uh, and then it's just, you know, I just knew it was time to go. And, uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy. You're leaving a job like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I've been, been influenced by young people. And also that gives me the most hope that we are going to dig ourselves out of where we are today in this world is because I think that generation and maybe the generation of all the people that are listening to us today, you're the future and you can change it. And there are people out there like those you see on this call who stand ready to help you. Yeah, Michelle, thank you. And I think that's, that's such a beautiful point. I think it, it leads us back to the, the original theme also of the conversation around how do you combine meaning and money, right? And how do you make sure that you don't assume that you have so much time, right? You, unfortunately, you know, you might run in front of the car tomorrow, you might, someone might get cancer and you have to care for them. You cannot know these things. And so if you think you can work for 10 years somewhere just to have enough money to do X, Y, Z, is there a way to somehow already combine that? I know it's tough sometimes, um, but it's really kind of that conscious thought process of how can I do this already now? Because there might not be enough time. And I think that's kind of the urgency, Michelle, I also felt from you that this idea of, hey, look, might as well start today rather than wait um, for for in five years and so thanks so much Michelle for for that Eric over to you in terms of your you know um, thoughts on, on this I um, have interviewed many leaders on the human factor and thank you for mentioning that um, I also have a podcast on misinformation called in reality so there's I'm just putting out a hook there Christian <laughs> the uh, and and they say uh, about leadership the thing that i learned which is one of the harder lessons for me um and i think a a mistake that many people make when they reach leadership positions is to is to think that the role is kind of all about you about you being the smartest person in the room and having all the answers and being the knight who rides in on a white horse to solve the problems of the company being a leader is about the people you work with. And mm-hmm. when I realized that my job was not to shine, but to help other people shine, is when I finally became an effective leader. That broadens to roles uh, across um, any career, even if you're not in a leadership position, is that what gives you meaning is serving others. And there, how, however you choose to phrase it. At Money Magazine, um, the the goal was was not to help people get an extra, you know, percentage point on their their stock market investments. It was to help people provide for their families, 
to have financial security, to remove that worry from their life, and to keep ordinary people out of the hands of people in the financial industry who would take advantage of them. So that was how we framed our mission and uh, in terms of service. At, at Inc. and Fast Company, it was also to the same kind of mission to help entrepreneurs succeed, to, to paint a vision of a future for business that was progressive and driven by innovation, creativity, and social justice. Um, so I, I think that that, and now as I sort of look ahead to the rest of my life, I know for sure that it is not going to be successful if it doesn't have meaning and that meaning comes from service to others. Beautiful. Thank you, Eric, for, for sharing. And I, I feel to your point, I think you also, wherever you started, you made it meaningful, right? You could have, to your point, any of these publications could have led into a very different direction, right? You could have focused on very different things that could have been very different, but you also used it as a platform to bring in that kind of ethos, right? And I think that's something we've been talking a lot about, um, especially with young people. How do you not take any job for given? Like, how can you, as a given, but how can you go into a job and then say, even if it's in a bank, how can I then get that bank to do a woman entrepreneurship program for 10,000 people in XYZ context? So how can I shape my position in a way that feels more meaningful? Because we're all realistic that you cannot always pick, but is there a way then to, to shape it in some way? And, and I think to Michelle's point earlier, we always have more power than we think if we find a topic that other people are excited about. And if we can then bump into the person in the elevator and tell them about it, they might pick it up. And so it's kind of those things where I think, Eric, to your point, I think you've been a great exemplar of, of how you've always shaped the roles into your kind of idea of what meaningful uh, could, could look like. And I think that's, that's, that's really interesting in, in that I, regard. Christian, if I could just add to it, I, I, I didn't mean to sound only as if you had that power if you were a leader in your company. You have that power wherever you are. You can always set an example of how to be a good colleague, uh, about how to find meaning in what you're doing, uh, and apply that um, not only to your own work, but into the atmosphere, um, the culture that is all around you. And that not only makes your life more successful and better, but it does the same. It radiates out to everybody. Yeah, no, that's good. And then uh, to your point, Eric, I think there's a lot of examples out there where interns led to the biggest shifts in companies. PricewaterhouseCoopers is taking um, you know, measures towards social and environmental impact into their accounting. Um, ideas and so on like these kind of things come from a lot of times from the bottom up um, people who inspire people so I think there's a lot of power to your point in, in good ideas coming from everywhere um, and then connecting with, with people um, and Gina what are your kind of uh, thoughts on this and, and what wraps it up for you well I love uh, the conversation around meaning and I think for me it's um, more and more I'm aware that for me success is making sure I am living a more holistic life uh, I mean a lot of the times, especially when we're starting and then we, we become good at what we are doing and, you know, and if you become a leader or you're just very good, whatever, it doesn't matter the title at this point. I'm just saying you're passionate about what you're doing. It's very easy to get lost in work, in the mission, in the purpose, in the, and, and not balancing your life holistically and reminding that part of finding meaning is what's the meaning of you of a person? Why am I here? And my role is not my only identity. I have a lot of identities. So yes, I am a social crazy entrepreneur that decided to teach photography to blind people 16 years ago. And then I decided to start a consultancy to do more work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And definitely you will see that Gina has a lot to do with changing the narrative, representation, opportunity, because I'm determined to reduce inequality, for sure. And I love it and I own it. But Gina is also, you know, a daughter, a friend, a colleague, uh, an inner child that wants to go and play and have fun and nurture yourself also and travel and the explorer. And uh, so I think when we talk about meaning, I would just say part of a success story is that we're only human. And in this life, it's not all about just work. Work is part of who we are. But it's so easy to get lost in the identity of our roles. and. As founders and social entrepreneurs, I always say we have that beautiful 
light that shines and you're like, wow, no, it's amazing leader or change maker or wow. But it also comes with a great shadow that we have to be aware of it. Shadow towards others to be able to shine within the organizations and within our networks and a shadow towards ourselves of saying, have I taken time to be present in other of my roles and my identities? Am I nurturing that side? Because it comes back at, at, the, at the end of our life, no? That, that question is, it's not all about the impact on the work. It's also that you had those moments to enjoy life and to really be part of that story. I always say the biggest gift we have is our story. Let's keep building that story, creating, be curious to, to listen to other stories, but also for us to keep adding new chapters. And if it's all about work, if it's all about the impact, if it's all not the job, the title, it becomes quite a boring story, right? I think <laughs> there's more to it. Um, so I think for me that success more and more is making sure that the new chapters I'm writing of my story are more holistically, are integrated, and, and I take the time for all those different moments. I always say, I'm, I, for years now, I start my day by hugging myself because it's saying, I'm here. I, I'm here, no matter what else is going to happen, but it, it's about embracing me, you know? Um, so I think that's my invitation. Let's embrace ourselves and, and the meaning of our life and who we are is not just the titles and the roles. It's all of it, you know, holistically integrated. That's a beautiful segue, I think, to, to you know, uh, the, the, the final rounds. Um, we, we, you know, have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been so inspiring. Um, and I think, um, Gina, I think you have a great reminder also for everyone. Uh, I think a lot of people who will listen to, to, to the conversation will want to have a real impact in the world. Um, one of the things that, that we've also seen is that a lot of leaders who are a light in the world are not necessarily a light at home. And I think it's kind of really that idea, right, that you're a light to yourself and a light to your family versus just kind of out there um, uh, doing great things for the world. And I think that's kind of combining those two being really at the core of, of a meaningful uh, life. And so the last kind of question to all of you, um, you know, wrapping it up is, are there any final thoughts you feel you definitely wanted to get out? And you were so generous with your time today. Is there anything we can help you with, anything any other hooks you want to put out there for people to, 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 to connect with you with? Or is there anything else that you, you wanted to leave us with? Final quotes, you name it. Um, Michelle, do you want to kick it off? Yeah. I, thank you so much for talking about your, your personal life. Because the other thing, I, you know, I told you about my husband passing. But I, during, the, during uh, this global pandemic, I slowed down long enough to realize that I didn't want to spend my life alone. And I met a wonderful man and I got married six months ago. And uh, so that pandemic, it was horrible, but boy, did it have an effect on a lot of people, especially me. So, um, I, you know, I just wanted to say that because I'm very thankful now that I'm going to go forward in life with a much more balanced, holistic life too. So, uh, you know, just thanks so much, Gina, for bringing that up. And then I'd say, stay tuned. Um, I'm, I'm going to launch something, uh, you know, very soon and I'm calling it the McKenna collaborative and the collaborative is just that I've always been a collaborative leader. Um, and so I'm looking to collaborate with people in and around the kinds of things I'm interested in and trying to create more serendipity in my life, uh, by actually systematically searching for it on a daily basis as my full-time job, instead of as, you know, sort of a byproduct of my natural self. So just stay tuned. And, um, you know, I'd love to just, you know, find us on LinkedIn, find us online, uh, and, uh, let's just keep connecting the dots. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and uh, Eric. Uh, well, I would uh, also in invite anyone on this call to to connect with me too. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn, and I'd love to continue this conversation, which has been wonderful. Thanks so much to you, Christian and Gina and Michelle. Um, Gina, you certainly live the idea that vulnerability is a superpower, and <laughs> you brought that home in this conversation. Uh, I would say uh, if I, I could leave leave us with any one thought it's that um kindness is always the, the right choice the idea that don't uh, it is uh it's it's always the um it should always be the default choice it will never let you down it's always the correct response um 
understand that um, that people's motivations are generally, um, maybe put it another way, the best way to approach any situation in work or elsewhere is to assume good intentions on the part of the people you're dealing yeah. with. And that will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. And Eric, exactly. In the workplace and, and especially also in, in personal relationships, right? Love relationships, the toothpaste, you know, problem being exactly that um, of how do you not get, get fed up about it, but actually talk about the underlying um, probably positive intention of the person and, and to your point. So that's a beautiful a positive intention uh, piece. And then Gina, uh, um, last but absolutely not least, um, what's your thoughts? No, well, thank you very much. Um, I, for me, again, reach out. I would love to connect. I think, as we're saying, let's keep this constellation with lots of light to shine out there. So feel free to connect. Um, I, I, a lot of people call me the connector. So <laughs> more dots uh, to connect happily. I also think there's this, uh, I, this part of inviting people to see things differently without fear you know let's go out there and i use different glasses and move and change perspectives because uh, magic can happen i always say when when you really believe in the impossible the incredible can happen and for sure i can tell you in my life that has happened a lot of the time uh with a bit of that ingredient of don't stop dreaming you know uh and when it's getting tough and you cannot see the whole picture literally sometimes just looking up and see the sky but there's no limit will help you breathe and see things from a different perspective and in that level I would also love to share a little bit where I am at the moment and if anything anyone wants to be part of this is more than welcome but at this stage I'm actually working a lot on creating a more inclusive narrative so I'm sure there's conversations to carry on here I think we're at a stage where representations and different stories need to be told for people to connect to be seen to really get out there and and reach their dreams with no limitations you know so I'm working with different media so I'm sure I'm going to talk to you partners and and storytellers how we can invite people to own the story reconnect with it to really keep achieving their goals uh, but also in our communication no internal externally marketing oh we need a change in the narrative and I think we're ready for it um, and I'm at that stage I still don't sh don't know the packaging of how these and I mean that <laughs> uncertainty moment, uh, which is really cool and exciting for a creative person. Uh, but reach out if anyone is interested to carry on that conversation. I think it's, it's really nice time to tell a different story. And that's part of my legacy, making sure there's a different narrative that allows people to be seen beyond the label and really see their intersectionality and shine and get out and all, do all the things you want to do, right? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here and just contact me happy to carry on the conversation and thank you for the invitation um christian for sure we've bumped into each other in so many moments in our lives uh we've been dancing from new mexico from the uk from the us you know but bumping around and i remember when you were sharing the idea of your first book on the serendipity mindset um and uh, it's so amazing to see now you have your both of the books and it's a reality and it's great to be part of this dance with you so thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Gina. And, 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 and like I said, I think your, your journey has been super inspiring and any excuse to bump into uh, you has always been uh, uh, very well taken. Um, so so it, 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 we, we, um, I'd love to wrap it up with, with two thoughts. One is, I feel one of the things that comes out um, uh, of this conversation is that the only constant in your life is change, right? And I think this that you're, that you're being okay with it, right? This idea that you constantly kind of in iterations and I think that hopefully takes the fear away from some people also in the audience that you always have to have it all figured out and know exactly what you're doing realizing that some of the most amazing leaders in the world um, actually are also sometimes winging it and that's part of it that's <laughs> part of doing it and I think that's kind of really to me one of the key takeaways also for especially young people in the audience to say you don't have to have it all planned out as long as you develop a compass that somehow kind of leads you somewhere being into curiosity whatever it is, but something that kind of guides you a little bit, the rest will, will usually fall into place with the right attitude and, and, and then kind of also connecting with the right people like Michelle, Eric and Gina, highly recommended to obviously keep in touch with, with, with the three. And so the second is really closing on uh, a quote that our conversation reminds me of um, by Margaret Meads um, that I think you three embody absolutely, which is that you should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because it is the only thing that ever has. And I think that's really, I think the power of the things you talked about is 
there's a lot of things you like people might have told you you will never achieve this you will never do this 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 cannot be done and then you do it and then it, it seems impossible until it's done and then it's done right and so i think it's kind of these things where hopefully people who listen to this also go out there in the world and and you know there's a lot of cynics out there but like really kind of keep that um, 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 idea that there is a lot you can do in the world and hopefully we can be part of helping you shape that that i think is our role as um, people in this room, please do connect with all of us. Um, if we can be of help on your journeys, do get in touch. And for now, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, Michelle, Eric, and Gina, for uh, joining the panel. Mimi, Michelle, and uh, Stephen, thank you so much for pulling the strings, strings in the background. Um, for now, have a wonderful day, and uh, see you all very soon, I hope.